Life sometimes come at you fast Tragedies make your life unravel You feel like you wanna give up and stay locked down Even when your heart is shattered You still got a life to live You still got a life to live So don't give up We are beautiful miracles We are beautiful miracles We are beautiful miracles So don't everyone and thank you for joining me on my podcast beautiful tragedy um, if you like what you're hearing would you please like comment share and subscribe in today's episode i am joined by my friend and fellow writer natasha carlo she resides in trinidad and tobago with her husband and two living children she and her husband are parents to five children three three of whom were lost to previously undiagnosed lupus anticoagulant antiphospholipid syndrome. Writing from a position of faith, N Natasha explores issues of loss, grief, pregnancy after loss, motherhood, and parenting her rainbow babies. She believes that women who experience loss need to hear stories from other women who have walked the same path and hopes to help make the experience less isolating for other moms. This belief led her to dedicate her time to working with families experiencing pregnancy loss in her country. She is the author of Happy Tears and Rainbow Babies and Mike Nero and the Superhero School, and is a contributing writer at Pregnancy After Loss Support and Her View From Home. So thank you so much for joining me, Natasha. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yes. Well, you know, um, on this podcast, we talk about subjects that can somewhat be seen as taboo, but, um, you know, those things can never change if we don't shed the light on them. So um, if you would be so kind to um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your story of loss. Absolutely. Um, you know, so hi to everyone in the audience. So like Carrie said, my name is Natasha and I, you know, I lived a very carefree, idyllic life in my country. You know, I had never really been impacted by loss in a personal way. Now, interestingly enough, I did work as an itinerant counselor. So I dealt with loss fairly regularly i even dealt with pregnancy loss fairly regularly enough to know that oh this is a thing that happens to people you know people have pregnancy losses and you know i would have approached it in a very clinical way um you know just not having any personal experience with it myself and in 2014 that all changed for me um my husband and i we were married less than a year so not in any way planning to have a child at that time but we got pregnant and we were ecstatic we were so happy and even more so when we found out we were having twins identical twins and you know we were really we just dove into our pregnancy there was no stuff in us nothing the doctor said to us about you know this being a very delicate pregnancy or you know, the need for caution in this pregnancy, nothing could stop us. We were ready and we were diving into the prospect of being parents to two. And, you know, I, I remember the day we found out that our babies were gone. I remember I woke up and I just, oh, I was in a bad mood. I, I didn't know why and nothing had happened. There was nothing to indicate that the pregnancy was over there was no sickness there was no in fact i would apart from morning sickness there was nothing to indicate that anything was amiss uh, but i was just in a really bad mood and i remember i didn't even want to go to the appointment but we made it to the appointment because we were about to find out the sex of our babies you know we had taken bets from family members we had our personal preferences and names put out and you know i i remember just going in there and not being able to shake this feeling this 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 ickiness this icky feeling and we went in and i remember the technician you know she she just suddenly got very uncomfortable and you know she said you know i i need to go 
called the doctor in and I said, please, what was what's happening? Just tell me what's wrong. And she said, you know what? I, I the, the, you might have questions that I can't I can't answer. So I'm gonna leave this to the doctor. And would you know at that point I still didn't figure it out. I still did not figure it out at that point. You know, I just thought maybe there was an extra hand, you know, which I was I was willing to handle. I, I could deal with that, you know, an extra hand or an extra foot or, you know, something was wrong. But inevitably the doctor did come in and say to us that our babies were gone. Um, you know, and I remember very clearly her saying to me, I need you to understand that both your babies are dead. Hmm. They're both gone. There's no ifs and uh, there's no question about it. Your babies are gone. And I remember just collapsing into my husband's arms, just collapsing. And you know, saying, you know, you know what, what comes next. You know, there's the calls to be made and the procedures to be done with pregnancy loss. And you know, just it all just happened in the fog, you know. Somebody, I felt as if someone, probably my husband, had their hand on the, on the small of my back and was just pushing me along. And I just went along with what happened, what was going on, you know? So that was a really, really difficult time for me. And it was a difficult time for my husband as well. Um, you know, having to care for me in that way for the very first time in our marriage. We were already such a young marriage, but having to pick me up every day and, and, you know, go through that period. It was really, really difficult for us, but we, we lean into each other and I'm, I've always been grateful for that. We were able to lean into each other and, you know, even as we were grieving, we, a few months later, not very much later, we found out we were pregnant again, but this time we were a different couple. You know, we were wiser. You knew more. Yeah, you knew more. We were wiser. We were a different couple this time. So we learned not to shout it to the world. Um, very few people knew that we were pregnant this time. And, you know, I knew to be very cautious in how far I was allowing my heart and my mind to go. So I was pregnant for even, even a shorter period this time. We lost this baby even sooner so i remember this time it happened i was like okay well at least you know at least i didn't get my hopes up you know or at least you know nobody knew that it was happening you know those are the things that you say to yourself to comfort yourself you know nobody knew and i don't have to one go through the pain of the miscarriage and the embarrassment of somebody who you know that term that we use someone who lost a child you know i i had it and then i lost it you know and so we i think this one was even harder for me because it felt very final it felt like you will not have a child you know um well, and it was also a, probably a very lonely experience because you didn't share it with anyone. And I could understand wanting to protect yourself because then you didn't have to tell everyone over and over again. But that loneliness is 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 painful. Yeah. And honestly, there was a lot of shame for me. And, you know, I remember not very long after having the second miscarriage, having to deal with a uh, on having to work with a client who was going through a miscarriage a miscarriage and i remember saying things to her like you know there's nothing to be ashamed of you didn't do anything wrong and i remember thinking you're such a fraud you are not being truthful right now because this is exactly how you feel about your own and so the guilt started came because you know i just didn't feel like myself for a very long time i didn't feel like myself but once again i didn't have a lot of time to sit with those feelings because i got pregnant again and man it, it took me months to, to to 
to believe that this pregnancy was real. It took me months to believe. Even after I started to show, I just, I must have been a very strange pregnant person. <laughs> I must have painted a very strange picture. You know, I was obviously happy. I was feeling the baby moving, but I can't say that I was ever excited. Cautious, right? optimistic. Uh, on some days, yeah. on some days, right. on some days. Right. Other days, not so much. Other days, it felt like, okay, so this is the furthest along I've ever been. So if I have a miscarriage and right now, I'm going to have to push out this baby. So I have to, I have to prepare myself, you know, and there were a lot of days like that, yeah. you know, pregnancy after loss is a very difficult process. Um, but we, I prayed constantly. You know, I, I, I said, I don't have the strength to be optimistic about this baby. So I'm going to need you to, to let, him, let him or her know that I love her. You know, I know that you're there with them. So you have to let them know that mommy loves them. She's just in a really difficult place right now. Sure, sure. So my daughter was born healthy and it was... I mean, we've all, you know that moment where you hold your baby, it was magical, you know? And for me, that magic though, very quickly gave me to a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that was my grief. That was my grief showing up and saying, hey, we, we, gotta, we gotta work through some things, you know? And so, I was a very anxious parent. I remember, you know, but my husband and I slept in shifts because somebody had to be up to watch that baby sleep. We slept in shifts. And if I woke up and saw my husband fall asleep, I was, I was, I was pissed. Like, you gotta be up, you gotta watch her, you know? She's perfectly fine, but we have to watch her. So that went on for a little while. And, you know, I very quickly became pregnant again. Um, and so this pregnancy, I don't want to say it was a little bit easier, but I think I had learned a little bit more about my body and about knowing what feels wrong, what feels okay. So I wasn't as panicked during this pregnancy. And my son was born, he was born healthy and bouncing and really just, I felt like, okay, this is my family. My family is complete. And, you know, a little while after my son was born, I started to think about what do I want to say to my kids about our family and who we are as a family. And I realized that I didn't want to be disingenuous in front of my kids I can I can fake it to anybody else but not my children mm -hmm. not my children and I wanted them to know me and the fact is that knowing me means knowing that I had miscarriages and that that is a part of my story and that is a part of why I parent the way I parent that's a part of why I work the way I work you know and I really started thinking about how would I want to talk to my children about my grief and the fact that my grief exists along with my gratitude for them and my love for them and, and everything. And, you know, I, I sat down one night and I just started writing a letter to my kids. And that letter somehow became my first book, wow. Happy Tears and Rainbow Baby, which, you know, told our story about, you know, that, that relationship that between joy and grief and how very often sorry something's happening <laughs> and how very often they can occur together and you know that book went on to you know do really well and a lot of people would message me and say hey thank you i didn't realize that this was a conversation i wanted to have with my own with my own children but I'm gonna have this conversation with my children. And 
that was a conversation that never stopped between me and my kids. It never stopped. We talk about their siblings all the time. We talk about their feelings all the time. And because we had that conversation, it really opened up other types of conversations for us. So we're a very communicative family. Yeah. Very, very communicative family. And coming out of my experience of writing that book, I started to write for other spaces. And really writing allowed me that expression, you know, to to own my grief and to acknowledge that I am not alone in my grief. Yeah. And you know, that realization, and I know you might you might identify with this but realizing that you can speak about something that so many people struggle with kind of gives you, it makes you feel, there's a sense of responsibility for your fellow, for your fellow grievers, right? Yes, yes and so, And so I started to, to realize that the ability to speak on it was a gift. Yes. And I used it as best as I could to help other people. And I, 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 I teamed up with an incredible organization in my country and we facilitate a support group for babies who live only in our hearts. And we have lost families come in and we talk and we share about grief and about life after grief and what that can look like and, you know, and that's 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 why I'm here. I have since, you know, done further studies in in grief counseling, which is a very particular type of counseling. It's very very niche, and you know how to better help families through that grief process. Well, so, I would imagine that you can give them such a great perspective because it's something that you've been through, and you know I find it interesting too that you know as a therapist. Um, you know, I don't know, I guess in a way, like I would look at you and think, well, you would know how to do this, you know, because you have the tools, whereas someone who has not (laughs) doesn't. So, you know, um, obviously I'm sure it wasn't just like, a I did this, this, and this to learn how to have grief and joy at the same time, because I feel like that's something I'm trying to figure out and Mm -hmm. go through feelings of guilt and, you know, if I'm too happy, well, am I not grieving properly? Or if I say things a certain way, am I not doing this properly? So like, you know, what was your process with learning how to do those things? I mean, before I answer that, where, where, where does that, where does that come from? All of this pressure to do it so perfectly, nothing else in life is done perfectly. Why do we feel the need to grieve perfectly as well? You know, it's, it's so interesting. And I think it's because our society really has a hard time with people being in pain and acknowledging Mm -hmm. pain. Mm -hmm. And so we want to hurry up and put a, put a bow on it and send it on. We don't want to be uncomfortable. You know, we just want to pretend like we're all happy and everything's great, Mm -hmm. but it's like, no, that's really not how it goes for people. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, to your question, I think for me, the road was not linear. It was not it wasn't pretty either. And one of one of the greatest tools I have is the fact that I can honestly say that to my clients. I can honestly say that I struggle badly with grief. I struggle with my guilt. So if you are also struggling, that's something we can talk about because I've I've been there. You know, this this was not pretty for me. And I had all the guilt and all the feelings. So you know, this is a safe space. You can, you can tell me the bad feelings. You can tell me the undesirable things because pretty sure I've been there too. So, you know, so we, you know, I, I, I offer them more than anything else. I offer them honesty. I offer them safety to share their stories. And, you know, I, I found that really that's all people need. We don't need and, I, and I'm speaking both as a griever and someone who facilitates grief. There's no need for perfect words or, you know, fixes. There's no need for that. There's a need to show me that you care and you can empathize with my grief and that my grief isn't undesired to you. It isn't 
icky <laughs> for lack of a better way to you you know right so yeah uh, and, and that's half the battle that's half the battle right there you know yeah yeah. Um, I know we talked a little bit about um, some things that people said to you, um, you know, like, um, you know, I think people feel like we, I don't know, we were talking about how you said that people thought that there was like something wrong with you or you did something wrong. And to me, that really blew my mind. And then I started thinking about the fact that, oh, actually kind of people have insinuated that to me too. Like, did yeah. I do something wrong? And so let's talk a little bit about that. So, you know, I, I feel like that is such a part of my culture that misfortune really means that you've done something wrong and beyond grief if you if your car if you have, if you get into a car accident you know people think that you've done something wrong you know it's really this idea that bad things only happen to you if you've done something to to deserve it in a way you know like and, karma I mean, that's, that might not be the language we would use, but pretty okay. much. It, it's probably okay. not the language we use, but I think that that's the closest it, it comes to it. Okay, right? okay. And, you know, be, because it's how people protect themselves. It's how they protect themselves from being vulnerable to what you've experienced. So you must have done something wrong for this to happen, because otherwise this consensus happened to me as well, and that is not okay. That is not okay. So I understand it. You know, now I understand it. People are really trying to find out how do I protect myself from having something like this happen to me. Got it. Got so, it. you know, yeah, I've, I've dealt with quite a few statements, you know, people asking me, you know, write down what, what, what did you do to deserve this? What did you do? You must have done something really wrong. Have you, you know, confessed what you've done wrong? you know and you know i i i've had all sorts of reactions to this in the seven years that i've been dealing with grief all sorts from the really 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 good responses that i feel really proud of to you know the ones that i don't feel that proud about but i think one of the tools that i've been given now is information and i like to meet those 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 types of things with information so you know i can say i can say to someone that you know one in four pregnancies and then and then a miscarriage and i just happen to be one in four mm -hmm. and i'm okay with that now right what I would want for you is to understand how difficult it is. And I really hope that you would never experience it. Right. But well, and people, pregnant. yeah. And I know people have said, well, you know, it wasn't even a real baby or, you know, something like that because maybe of how early along you were. And I yes. just feel like how dismissive that is of the pain because yeah. when you, when you have a bit, when you get pregnant and, you know, it was a baby made from love and you have these hopes and dreams and, no matter if that pregnancy goes on to, you know, have a baby or not, those hopes and dreams were still shattered. You know? And so it's like people don't, people have a hard time acknowledging that, you know, I personally have not experienced a pregnancy loss, but I can empathize with that because I know, I know how happy I was and excited yeah. and, you know, and, and honestly, um, I didn't have a lot of anxiety in my pregnancy. So, you know, to think about how, it's sad because you didn't, you know, you, you couldn't enjoy it because of your anxiety. And it's like, yes. you know, the grief and loss kind of stole that from you, yes. stole that, you know, that part of it. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I've never had a baby shower. It's just not something that I can fathom celebrating a child who isn't here yet. I've mm -hmm. never had a baby shower. Um, I've not, I, I maybe have one or two pictures being pregnant but that was not something that i wanted to memorialize until i have countless pictures of my children countless but no pictures pregnant because you know it just wasn't the way my pregnancy worked out right and you probably couldn't even relax at all until the baby was here but then you have a different kind of anxiety once anxiety. the baby is here because yeah. you, you know what can happen you know yeah. and, and that's yeah. the thing i feel like 
when you when you lose a child you walk around with knowledge that other people don't necessarily acknowledge that it can happen to anyone it doesn't matter how much you love your child or how you adore them it doesn't matter and i think that's part of what scares people and that's a loss of innocence that you know a lot of people who experience child loss talk about like the world the world is never the same there's the you know there's a marked difference between what you knew before and what you now know yeah 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 you know from what you know you know we talked a little bit about the cultural differences like how how are how is it different from what you know of the united states of of how we deal with things right so after my pregnancy loss when i was really getting into grief and getting into you know this the supports trying to find support one of the things that you know, I, I, of course, went to the internet and it, it just, it, it blew my mind how many places and services were available in the U.S. So how many, you know, women's groups, how many online organizations, how many Facebook groups, you know, were started. And that was pretty different from in my country where you know, it's a little bit different now. People are now embracing the idea of grief, but at the time, I think we maybe had one, one Facebook group that was doing the work and, you know, and so the access to resources was obviously different and that speaks to so many things. It speaks to the level of comfort we're discussing pregnancy loss or grief as a whole. It speaks to, you know, um, what we consider important you know because now with new information and people starting to sit up and say hey i this is my story i can share my story a lot of resources might are now becoming available but seven years ago this wasn't the case in my country and you know that was one of the things that really sadden me and kind of propelled me to action because I I can go online and I can see I can see countless countless support groups in one state right but in my country uh, th- there's one or two right. Right. you know so it really propelled me and I started very small very sh- very you know shakily you know just messily t- mess messy messily talking about my own grief and my own thing and you know eventually one thing led to another and I, I partnered with the organization here but you know that is a distinct difference between what grief looks like in the U.S. and what it looks like in in the Caribbean or my country. Right well you know I've always kind of thought that we were pretty bad at grief here in the United States. Um, While we might not be very good at it, you know, it's, we should definitely be thankful that um, we have access to the resources because I'm sure there are plenty of countries in this world who have nothing like that. And so, yeah, I definitely, I, you know, I just, thank you for what you're doing because my goodness you're giving a gift to people in your country that had you not experienced that it you know who knows what it would be you know and you know there's that the saying you know at least which i don't like i don't feel like yeah. there's at least anything in a child yeah. loss you know um you know you you had a terrible thing happen to you and you made something beautiful of it which is really you know what this podcast is about, you know, it's called beautiful tragedy because it was a terrible, something happened. And, you know, because of that, we're making something beautiful of it. It doesn't change the loss. It doesn't take that away, but it gives people, you know, just a space to know that you're not alone because grief is a very lonely emotion and you can feel like you're by yourself and you know by speaking about it i've realized that i'm not alone and i hope that i say at least one thing and i know that somebody today will hear one thing today that helps them to feel not alone and um you know we talked about um you know how you help others and how that has helped you and i just you know 
talk about that because you know the fact that you were already a therapist and that you know you know now you've been able to really make an impact on people and and your writing and stuff too so talk about that how that's kind of been therapy for you you know um one of the one of the greatest joys um you know one of the greatest joys is you know pulling up my social media and seeing a complete stranger say hi i just purchased your book and you know it has really helped me i'm pregnant right now i have I have had the experience of parents pregnant, pregnant with their able babies, send me pictures of the babies from the hospital and say, she's here, Aww. she's here, you know, and that's, that's the community that we create when we share our stories, yes. you know, uh, us sharing our stories led us to meet, right? Yes. And I have been so encouraged and so blessed by your story, so much so that and I've, and I've said this to you, I tell people about your story so often, wow. you know, um, you know, without using names or anything like that, I share your story so often and the lessons that you have learned from grief. And that's, and to me, that's the, that's the, that's the blessing that this beautiful tragedy has given us. We are now part of a community that is strong and it is thriving and it is alive and it, beats with you know just warmth and and love and to see somebody meet that community for the first time to see somebody say you know i i saw something you wrote and it led me to another article that somebody else wrote you know that is that is just that's a dream it's that a community dream. you wish you weren't a part of but you're right. also so grateful that there is yeah. something there. Yes. Um, and so um, what do you want people to know about pregnancy after loss? I think I want people to know that acknowledging the difficulty of pregnancy after loss is not me being ungrateful. It's not me not acknowledging the beauty that is happening, the, the, the blessing that is happening within me. It is simply an acknowledgement of how difficult this is. Yeah. It's, it's like you said, it's like you said to me before, you know, you can say something is hard or you can say that it's important and it really changes stuff. But that important process that you're into is also pretty hard sometimes. And I want people to stop putting that pressure on families and women pregnant after loss to be okay now. Yeah. So, so, so you're good now, right? You, you have your replacement baby, you're good now. There's no such thing as a replacement baby. We could have 10,000 babies that will never replace the child that we have lost. So, and it starts with empathy. It starts with me saying, me, the individual saying, huh, if this had happened to me, if I had to live with one, without one of my children, that might be pretty difficult. Right. So maybe what this couple needs, what this woman needs is grace and empathy and love and support rather than the judgment of, aren't you okay yet? You know, at least you can get pregnant again or, you know, at least you're young, or any of those statements that we don't like. We don't like those statements at all. Mm -mm. So, you know, I want, that's the one thing I want people to know that pregnancy after loss is beautiful, but it's difficult. And women need support. We need the support that it's okay to be honest about what we're feeling because we need to get those feelings out. Right. You know? Yeah, I know. I see a lot of people writing um, things like I'm holding space for you. And that's something that I have, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm learning how to do, you know, I, um, while what you've experienced is not the same thing as what I've experienced, I can hold space for you and understand what you've been yes. through. And I mean, just that permission to be okay and to not have mm -hmm. to put on the face and not have to, you know, act like everything is fine. Ha having that permission is just is, mm -hmm. is beautiful and it's freeing because you know the strength that it takes to go on after you've lost your child 
is immeasurable. And, you know, just giving people, like you said, the grace and understanding yeah. and um, just, just let me be sad. Yeah. Let me be sad. Don't try to take it away from me. You can't fix it. There's nothing you can say. And, you know, I, I'm, my hope is always that through this podcast that you can, we can face loss a little bit better because the truth of the matter is none of us are going to make it out of this alive, you know, and you know, how, how I wrap up every episode is a quote by Ram Das, and it says, we're all just walking each other home. We're all trying to figure this out. And, you know, a lot better things come from love than it does from hate and judgment, you know, so, so, you know, together we're figuring this out. We're, we're shining the light on something that can be very dark. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining me and thank you for the beautiful work that you're doing. And I'm just so grateful that we crossed paths. It was no accident. And no accident. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Carrie. And God bless you and God bless the work that you are doing as well. Thank you so much.